We've now completed the draping, the marking, and the truing of the front of the basic bodice. The next step is to do the back of the bodice. The back bodice has a waistline dart and a shoulder dart, similar to the darts on the front. In order to drape the back bodice, we're going to have to prepare the muslin in a similar way to the way we prepared for the front bodice. A piece of muslin will be needed that will be long enough and wide enough to fill the space that we intend to drape. The piece will be measured from the top of the metal band to the waistline plus two inches for the length of the piece of muslin. The width will go from the far side of the side seam at the underarm area, immediately below the arm plate, across to the center back. Whatever number is determined at that point, we will add four inches to that. This piece of muslin has already been torn, blocked, and pressed in preparation for the draping. We again need to mark in the grain lines in preparation for the draping. The first grain line is a center back line, which is the equivalent of the center front line, and again is placed approximately one inch from the raw edge, or from the selvage, whichever side you are working from. Measure over one inch, and then using either the pull method, the method with the ruler squared down, whatever method is comfortable for you, draw in a lengthwise grain. The lengthwise grain represents the center back line. Now, in addition to the lengthwise grain, crosswise grain is needed. The determination of the crosswise grain for the back is different than it was for the front. To begin with, we will measure down from the raw edge of the muslin on the lengthwise grain three inches. The cross mark represents the neckline. The neckline center back intersection. In order to plan for a cross grain line, I'm going to measure the entire length of the back, finished back, from neckline to waistline. And whatever number is determined, I'm going to transfer that to the muslin. and cross mark. That cross mark represents the waistline. We've now defined on the muslin the area of the back length from neckline to waistline. That area will be divided by quarters and the number of the first quarter will be measured down from the neckline on the center back line to become the cross grain line for the back. The cross grain line for the back normally falls at the shoulder blade level and is one quarter of the length of the back from neckline to waistline. That line will be squared across on the muslin, again following one thread for cross grain line. 
In addition to the lengthwise grain and the crosswise grain, we will need to determine the width from center back to the ridge. We spoke about the ridge when we talked about the armhole on the front. The ridge is the area immediately before the metal plate. At the shoulder blade level, which is the same on the figure as it is on the muslin, I'm going to measure across to the ridge. Whatever number I determine, I will to that number add one-fourth of an inch for ease and transfer that measurement to the muslin. One more line is needed, a guideline, which normally falls one and a quarter inches back towards the center back from the arm plate mark. Cross mark and draw in the lengthwise grain. In preparation for draping the back, it's necessary to anchor the shoulder, which is what we did before. It's also very important to expose the side seam of the form. We also don't want to lose the balance and the shape of the muslin as we've established it. So I'm going to run a row of pins about an inch and a half away from the tight body line down the muslin, securing the muslin well in place, releasing the pins that are holding the side seam and the waistline in place, and turn the muslin back so that the side seam of the form is exposed for draping the back. We now can turn the figure and go to the draping of the back. We'll turn back on the center back line in the same manner as we did for the front, creasing it with your fingernail. It's important that you establish exactly where the center line is so that you can line it up well with the figure. As with the front, we will begin with a place that we can identify on the figure and on the muslin. For this muslin, the place we can identify is the center back neckline intersection. We've marked that on the muslin and that's the beginning place. A pin at the neckline center back intersection opposing the direction that we plan to drape in. Another pin at the shoulder blade center back intersection and another at the waistline cross mark. One pin halfway between the shoulder blade and the waistline, thus establishing the lengthwise grain on the form. Once you've established the lengthwise grain, you proceed to establish the crosswise grain. In establishing the crosswise grain, we're looking for a similar shape to the one we were looking for at the front. If the cross grain line is parallel and level with the flat surfaces in the room, the line will form the muslin into a boxy shape. When the line is not straight, it does not box. It tends to fall into the body. Now, the cross grain line having been established and the plate or ridge mark having been established, I'm going to take that mark and move it back onto the ridge. What that does is establish an amount of ease that will appear across the back. And I'm going to just pin the muslin at the front, holding this little bit up so that the grain will not drop as I work with the muslin. I'm going to step back and look at it and see if indeed the cross grain line is straight and the lengthwise grain is squaring down from it because as with the front, 
the establishment of the crosswise grain is related to the lengthwise grain. We're looking for a squared L shape. When you're happy with the way it looks, it looks straight, we'll secure the guideline with a pin going up and then distribute the fullness across the back with pins going up and pins going down so that the fullness is held in place without having it all bunched in one spot. I've just distributed all of that ease across the back. Now, the next step will be, as with the front, to bring the lengthwise grain line or guideline down to the waistline. That will establish the straightness of the back and the opportunity to balance the side seam. The muslin should fall about halfway between the side seam and the princess line at the waistline. Now, it can fall a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left, but it should look reasonably straight and fall in that area. I'm pinning it in the middle of the waistline with a pinch of ease and securing the line so that when I pin the front side seam and the back side seam together, I will not pull away all of the ease that I've established. Once the line is secured, the guideline should be slashed to within about a quarter of an inch of the waistline. We then will turn to the side seam. As I mentioned at the beginning when we began this muslin, I said that this muslin would have a balanced side seam. A balanced side seam meaning that the grain lines of the front muslin and the grain lines of the back muslin are in perfect alignment. And the way you can tell they're in perfect alignment is by pinning the underarm seam at the plate and the side seam intersection on the tight body line and then pinning the waistline at the same place at the tight body line. Now when the line is pinned, if the muslin lines up perfectly straight from top to bottom, meaning that the grain lines are exactly at the same place, then your muslin is in perfect balance. If they do not line up exactly right, it means that this guideline has not been established exactly right. In that case, it's necessary to unpin the muslin and return to the guideline, remove the holding pins, and reposition the line so that the guideline falls straight. Repin it to make sure that you're getting a perfect balance. We'll then return to the side seam and pin it again at the tight body armhole intersection and at the waistline. and look for the perfect balance. When the muslin is in perfect balance, you can then take a striped fabric and have the lines perfectly chevron at the side. And that's the way a perfectly balanced muslin should look. Having established the balance at the side seam, we can now go on to the waistline dart. The waistline dart on the back, unlike the waistline dart of the front, does not have an established place. When we placed the dart at the front, we had a grain line dropping from the apex down and picked up on it. The back does not have that grain line, so the establishment of the dart is left to feeling for 
the princess line, and you can feel the princess line, it is a, a seam, and picking up the leftover muslin right on the princess line. The pin, again, will go up and down, straddling the waistline seam, picking up approximately a quarter of an inch of fabric over the waistline seam. The next step is to establish the vanishing point of the dart. And you can see where the body starts to fill the muslin and place a pin at the point that the dart is no longer necessary because there is body filling it. The one thing to be careful about in pinning for the vanishing point of the dart is that the dart does not come up above the lowered extended armhole, which has been established at the front. The need for ease across the back is obvious. You need to move your arms, you need to move up and down, and if you make the dart much longer than that, you'll be taking out all of the ease that you have established across the shoulder blade line. Having draped the bottom, we're ready to go to the top of the muslin and we will begin with the neckline. The draping of the back neckline is similar to the draping of the front neckline. One inch up from the neckline, center back intersection, slash across for one inch. And straight up, removing that rectangular piece of muslin. Feel the neckline seam with your fingernail and smooth the muslin around, establishing the crease of the neckline. Slash into the corner of your rectangle, coming down to about a quarter of an inch of that line. Do not come all the way to the line, because the line will shift as the neckline eases and comes around. The neckline will then be pinned at the shoulder neckline intersection, which has been established on the front muslin. Now, the back shoulder will also have a dart uh, similar to the one in the front. The difference being that the back shoulder dart is smaller and shorter. There isn't an apex at the back, so the difference between the shoulder and the back is smaller and therefore a smaller dart is needed. To establish the dart, the size and placement of it, we'll follow the grain line up from the guideline. And in doing that, you'll find that a small amount of muslin appears. It is not a large dart. The back shoulder dart will usually fall someplace between a quarter and three-eighths of an inch. It is rarely larger. Uh, it can be, but it is not usually so on a basic. Um, in addition to the shoulder dart, which will line up with the front shoulder dart when we pick it up, we also need to place two pinches of ease on the shoulder. One pinch will fall halfway between the neckline and the princess line, and the second pinch will fall halfway between the princess line and the ridge. Before picking up the dart, I'm going to pick up the first pinch, which straddles the shoulder seam, is very small, and is only as fat as a pin. So it is a minimum amount of fabric. The next pickup is the dart, which lines up perfectly with the front shoulder dart, and the amount has established itself. And the next step is to pick up the second pinch, which again is very small, straddles the shoulder seam between the princess line and the ridge, and then to pin down the muslin so that it doesn't slip when we mark it. And in doing that, we have now draped the back of the bodice. The next step after draping is the marking. We will begin the marking at the center back neckline and follow around 
the neckline, the shoulder, up to the shoulder blade line. Make sure your crease is very clearly marked, cross mark is very clear, and dot the neckline every half inch until you come to the shoulder neckline intersection, at which point we'll establish a cross mark. The back shoulder being different from the front in that it is more curved will require dots to indicate the placement of the truing ruler. I'm going to dot the front, the back shoulder over the front shoulder, ignoring the pinches. Do not mark the pinches, but the dart will be marked as for the other dart, sliding your pencil over the pin pickup and marking the direction of the shoulder, flipping over, marking the pin pickup again, and marking the direction of the shoulder. Continue the dotting up to the shoulder ridge intersection and cross mark. We'll place two dots on the ridge between the shoulder ridge intersection and the shoulder blade line. There will be no marks below the shoulder blade line at all around the armhole. The back armhole is never marked. We will not mark the side seam, but we will mark the waistline between the guideline and the side seam with a dot, the waistline between the guideline and the dart with a dot, cross mark the dart, and slide our pencil over the pickup, and the same on the other side. Slide your pencil above and below the pickup, indicate the direction of the waistline. Now the back waistline, falling in an area that is sharply indented, may or may not be perfectly straight from center back cross mark to dart. In that case, to be sure that we have some help in case it's not straight, we'll place a dot halfway between the center back and the dart. That completes the marking of the muslin. The next step is to remove the muslin from the form. Now, there are a lot of holding pins holding the muslin to the form. What you don't want to remove are the pins that are holding the dart, and you certainly don't want to remove the pins that are holding the side seams together. We'll remove just the holding pins, leaving the vanishing pin for the dart in place. Remember that the shoulder seam was anchored, and those pins have to be removed before the muslin can leave the form. And the pins that are going down the side seam. The reason it was not necessary to mark any of the back side seam on the form is because two lines that are sewed together should be as identical as possible. And one of the ways you make seams identical is by tracing one onto the other. And that's what we're going to do with the side seam of the muslin. We're going to trace the front tight body line, extended line, lowered extended cross mark, and waistline cross mark onto the back muslin so that we will have a side seam for front and back that are the same. We'll place the muslin on the tracing paper. It's very important to do this before you do anything else on the back. You never want to um, try to true the back while the front and back are pinned together. It's essential to get them separated. So using a tracing wheel and some carbon paper, I'm going to trace the tight body line. But before I do that, I'm going to trace 
the lowered extended cross mark at the armhole and the waistline cross mark. These marks are very important. If you trace the tight body line and the side seam and do not put in the cross marks for the waistline and the uh, lowered extended armhole, you're going to find that the other lines are of no use to you because you won't know where to pin them together. So we'll do the waistline cross mark first because it's so important. And the lowered extended armhole. And then trace the tight body line. And the extended line. And while the muslin is together, because it's important that the side seam allowance also be perfectly balanced, I'm going to draw in the seam allowance and trim away front and back seam allowance to one inch at the same time. Okay. Having done that, I'll put the front aside, turn over, and deal with the back muslin. Okay. As with the front, the very first thing you want to do on a muslin is get it as flat as possible for the truing. In order to do that, I'm going to remove the pins that are holding the pinches and I'm going to begin with the waistline dart. First checking to make sure that my cross marks and dart markings are very clear and there and doing the same on the shoulder dart. In order to establish the grain line for the waistline dart, I'm going to crease the muslin while it's still pinned together and then remove the pin and with a pencil and a ruler, follow the lengthwise grain up to the level of to the level of the pin that I established as the vanishing point. Now, the pin indicates how high the dart comes. It does not indicate exactly where it comes. The vanishing point will be the straight grain in the center of the dart at the level of the pin. Remove the pin and cross mark. Then join the waistline cross marks to the vanishing point on both sides, establishing the waistline dart. The shoulder dart. Remove the pin, and as with the front shoulder dart, we're going to join the cross mark closest to the neckline to the vanishing point of the waistline dart. With one line. Then the length of the dart is three inches, so from the shoulder cross mark that was the pin pickup. <clears throat> I'm going to measure down three inches, cross mark, and join the other side of the dart to it. The shoulder dart is established. The next step is to true the neckline <clears throat> with a French curve. <clears throat> From the center back, I'm going to square across. Now, the shape of the back neckline is somewhat straighter than the shape of the front neckline. So, you can usually square across for more than the quarter of an inch that was done at the front. You're going to follow the straight grain across as far as it looks straight. And then stop where the curve begins Place the French curve so that it picks up on the rest of the dots and continue to true the back neckline. The 
the back neckline will not be dropped. So having drawn it in, I can measure half inch for seam allowance. And trim away the excess muslin. The neckline then is completed and I don't have to deal with it anymore. The next step then, while the muslin is still flat before I have pinned the darts, is to draw in the back armhole. Now if you look at the figure, you will notice that the back armhole is somewhat straighter than the front armhole. It doesn't have the same deep curve and therefore needs to be followed straighter and shallower than the front armhole. We will drop a guideline from the plate cross mark down for about an inch or an inch and a quarter on grain. That guide will act as a barrier to be sure that when we true the back armhole we will not gouge out the armhole and make the armhole too tight. I'm going to place the curve so that I'm using that line as a guide for about an in, a half inch or maybe slightly more but then shallowing out and going on to follow down to the lowered extended cross mark thereby drawing in a shallow curve that will conform to the shallow shape of the arm plate at the back. The next step is to flip the curve over and follow the dots up, the ridge dots, to the shoulder ridge intersection. We will trim the armhole loosely, leaving about an inch and a half of seam allowance and then proceed to the back shoulder. The pinning of the back shoulder is the same as the pinning of the front shoulder dart. Crease the side closest to the neckline, cup the muslin, and bring the cross marks together. Picking up the fullness and matching the lines exactly. The truing of the back shoulder, unlike the front shoulder, will be done not with a straight ruler, but with the hip curve ruler. By placing the hip curve ruler with the curvier part going up towards the neck, we'll pick up all of the dots that are marked and true from neckline shoulder intersection to ridge shoulder intersection. The back shoulder gets a one inch seam allowance measured and marked and then is the trim. When you trim, you trim right through the fullness of the dart to the end of the muslin. Back shoulder. You can see that some of the body shape is now starting to appear in the muslin. The next step will be to pin the waistline dart. Again, creasing the line closest to the center back. Cupping the muslin and bringing the lines together. Starting at the vanishing point, picking up minimum fabric. You don't have to pin right to the end of the dart. The dart will tend to stay together. And pin the lines together, picking up just the smallest amount of muslin. If the muslin is well draped, you do not need a large amount of pins. 
very few pins will hold the muslin together. And that completes the truing of the back muslin. And we're ready to put the back and front together. Now, in putting the back and front together, it really doesn't matter whether you put back over front or front over back. What does matter is that you crease on the extended line. When you put the side seams together, you should see a tight body line extending on either side of the side seam. If you can't see those two lines, then you're pinning in the wrong place. Now, because it's a bias seam, it's preferable to pin the armhole, pin the waistline, and then fill in everything in between, picking up the edge of the fold and laying it down next to the other side. Okay, That is the side seam. And the next part to true is the waistline. Now, we know something about the waistline already because we already established that the grain line from center front to dart was going to be on straight grain. So from the dart, we'll follow across, looking carefully at the threads and drawing in a cross grain line from center front to dart at the front. We'll look at the back, and if the back looks as if it wants to be perfectly straight from dart to center back, then we'll draw it perfectly straight. If it looks like it's starting to curve off, then draw it as far as it looks like it wants to be straight and stop. The rest of the waistline will be trued with the French curve. Um, we know that when you have a seam that goes from wider at the top to narrower at the bottom in the waistline area, when the garment is worn, the side seam will tend to ride up on the figure. And because we are aware of that, we're going to add a quarter of an inch at the side seam in the waistline area. Just drop the side seam one quarter of an inch on the seam line, cross mark, and then draw the rest of the waistline to that lowered point. The curve will go from the straight part of the curve to the straight part of the front, dropping down to the side seam. The waistline will be drawn in two steps, the front and the back separately. You will probably find that as the curve drops down, and it's a very gentle curve, it will go through the first dot and miss the second dot and curve down nicely to the side seam. Very gentle curve. From the other side, the curve will begin at the back, straight grain, and curve through the first dot and miss the second dot. Make sure that they come exactly together. The waistline is generally treated as one seam and should be trued as one seam. The waistline area, even though it is a curved line, will take a one inch seam allowance. Garments frequently have to be adjusted at the waistline and the one inch seam allowance is helpful in doing that. One inch down, measured and then trim away the excess muslin. We're trimming through the two darts, through the side seam, and through 
through the waistline dart at the back all the way over to center back fold completes the bottom of the muslin the next step is to pin the back shoulder over the front shoulder now we did allow some ease in the back shoulder we put in two pinches of ease and when you hold the back shoulder and the front shoulder together it's necessary to pin the neckline shoulder into section and then check to see that your back shoulder is falling at least a quarter of an inch longer than your front shoulder. That ensures that the ease does indeed exist and you want to be sure it's there. When you know it's there, we will then pin the shoulder armhole together, match up the shoulder dart, and pin in between the dart and the neckline. And you should be able to see a little puff of ease on either side. If you can't see the ease, it's not there. And the ease is very important to the fit of the garment. At this point, the muslin is ready to go back on the figure for final checking. We're checking for the fit and the look of the muslin. The natural neckline is pinned to the natural neckline. We'll pin down to above the apex, put the waistline in place, and smooth up to below the apex. Turn the muslin around and pin the center back neckline into section, the shoulder blade level, the waistline center back into section, and the center back. We'll put the pinches of ease back in place in the back and in the front and take a look at what we've made. The muslin should be sitting comfortably on the form. There should be no cross pulls happening any place, front or back. If you see pulls going in either direction, something is badly done. We're going to look inside the muslin from the front and see if you can see the back armhole extending past the form about a quarter of an inch. If you can't see, when you look in, if you can't see the armhole, then chances are you've made the back too narrow and your armhole will not be comfortable at the back. You must see that armhole passing past the form when you look in the front. You want to be able to pick up the ease the overease and get back to a well-fitting garment without the overease. The garment should fit well on the tight body line. You should not use the ease for fit. The ease is over and above the fit of the garment. When you're reasonably certain that what you've done is good and true, the muslin can be removed and the armhole trimmed to one half inch for in preparation for the setting in of the sleeve. Half inch seam allowance on the armhole. That completes the draping of the first basic bodice.